Uh, we love a cartoon at Foresight. We love to try and explain what we're all about through the medium of illustration. And this is one of our favourite ones. So this sort of epitomises everything that we're talking about. Everything that we had as challenges as in-house recruiters. Everything that we hear is still a challenge for pretty much everybody that we speak to as well. This for <coughs> us is our <coughs> method of recruiting today in corporate UK, US, Europe, Far East, Australasia. Our intrepid recruiter is Jane on the far left. She's having a great day, she's storming it, there's more stuff going out than's coming in, she's filling left, right, left, right, centre, she thinks she's on to Easy Street, little does she know what's coming her way. And this is the problem we have. She, the right hand side is the business she works for, she has no clue as it stands that there's 170 roles and an exec search coming. So all of those reps coming at us at the left field because we're just so busy doing our day to day job, it sometimes creates this perception. Yeah, of resourcing or talent acquisition out there in the business. We're too reactive, we're too slow, recruitment's painful, they don't understand our recruitment needs. But if we really think about it, how can we kind of get into private mode when we've got all of those vacancies coming at us? So, some simple maths, yeah? If we've got 25 live recs, that's it, 25 live recs, that's less than an hour and a half per rec per week, yeah? To source, engage, attract, assess, all your general admin, offers, engagement, everything that goes with filling a rep, that's an hour and a half per week, right? So is there any wonder why we can't get off this hamster wheel of reactive recruitment when all of our weekly time is swallowed up on the here and now? That's kind of not why we're in reactive mode. Why we're in reactive mode is all of those hiring managers out there in the business, yeah, that have got growth plans, levers, retirees, that they haven't told us about yet. Yeah, so we've potentially got double, triple the amount of hiring, plan, uh, hiring managers with recs in their heads, coming down the line like a juggernaut, whether we like it or not, whether we start complaining, well actually Danny, I've got 30 live recs, 35, 40, 50, when I was at Rolls Royce I think I peaked at 120, yeah, it is physically impossible to get around every single potential hiring manager when all of your time is swallowed up on the here and now. If we think about planning and getting the data that we're going to talk about in a moment um, and what that can do for you, um, one really big and really important thing for us is recruiter experience and recruiter productivity. We all work hard, don't we? Um, we all have a lot to do. But what can we do differently to actually make our lives better? Because being a recruiter is difficult, it's tough. You, know? you have to be many, many different things. You've got to be a project manager, you've got to be a copywriter, you've got to be a sourcer nowadays, you've got to be an influencer, a salesperson, you've got to be a closer. The list, it literally goes on and on and on. But if you've got 25 recs, as we said earlier, and that's conservative, let's face it, there aren't enough hours in the week or the day to do all of those tasks really well and to keep everybody happy. Not unless you're working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Maybe some of you are, but you know that's not a great place to be. So we kind of think the only way that you can change that is by changing how you work. How do you get to the point where you're not having to react to things? You know, that urgent need that's just landed on your ATS that you've got to throw your immediate attention to straight away. Because we've all been there as well, haven't we? In, in one week, you walk in thinking everything's hunky-dory. Before you know it, 5, 10, 15 new roles have just landed. They all need preparing, they all need briefing, they all need sourcing in chunks of time. And the only thing you can do is react. And you have to put your attention into it because you can't say, I'm going to leave that one and not brief it for four weeks because I'm busy. It's got to get done. But what happens then? Other things fall by the wayside. So all those fantastic things that we talk about, those strategic initiatives, those projects that Hiring manager engagement piece, dare I say it, candidate communications, they all fall by the wayside because all of a sudden you've got this big block of activity that you've got to do right now. If you have a plan, if you have that information or the majority of it, the same things need to happen for every role. You still need to prepare, you still need to source and attract, you've got to assess, you've got to offer and you've got to onboard. You don't have to do it in such defined blocks of time. You can spread it out. If you've got 90, 100, 110 days heads up, yes, you still brief, but you brief early. Imagine having four weeks. You can brief a role four weeks over a four-week period, for example, not the next day. 
wait in Salz for a month, six weeks, rather than as quickly as you need to because of higher amount of screws and down your neck. These are all the things that you can achieve if you have that sort of elite time. So I'll give you two, I'll give you two scenarios. Right, one with a plan, one without a plan, right? So without a plan, Susie, hiring manager, right? She's busy writing a business case that she needs two extra sales execs in five months' time. But the first experience she has is when she fills in the ATS or walks up to your desk and says, hi, recruiter, I need two sales execs. And we say, when do you need them? And it's always ASAP because maybe she now has targets against those. So then she's going to be really unhappy when we say, right, great, it's going to take five, six, seven weeks to fill because that's how long recruitment takes. But it's already manifesting itself into her perception that recruitment is slow. Then that turns into her chasing us for updates, again, building on that perception that we're not doing a good job when really we are. Or experience number two, <clears throat> you've contacted Susie proactively five months ago to find out what her hiring demand is going to be for the next three, six, nine, twelve months. And she informs you, well, actually, I'm currently in the process of writing a business case, and it's 99% signed off. So you proactively engage with Susie to book in a brief three, four months ahead of when you normally would. So now what kind of perception is she going to have when you've contacted her for the hiring demand, driven that process, then you've recontacted her and said, look, now we need to brief because this is how long it takes. You've now got an extra three, four months to do all those things Craig mentioned. Her experience is going to be the opposite end of the spectrum. And furthermore, that time to hire could even be longer, but she's going to have a better experience because you could still be recruiting people before the need actually hits. Imagine if you could, on, in a, on a daily basis, dedicate time to candidates. It might sound a bit crazy at the moment, and you can't do it because, like I said earlier, those big chunks, chunks of work, they just fall on you and all of a sudden everything goes out the window, all your best plans are shot to pieces because you've got to get this work out the door. What you're doing is you're focusing on your hiring managers because they're the ones that come and sit on your desk. They're the ones that you see as your stakeholder. They're the ones you see as your customer because all of the work is focused around what they need. And the candidate, I'm afraid, quite often becomes a commodity. The, co the candidate is the means to the end. The candidate is the number in your ATS. The candidate is the, the way that you get your to-do list down by one. And you go, Christ, I've got to fill that role forgotten as a person at the other end of that, not least the other 19 that I've had to reject or have fallen away along the process. So planning means time. Time means thinking differently. Time means putting time in your diary every day, every couple of days, just to think about candidates so you don't lose them. So imagine what your performance could be like if suddenly all of your recs have said, don't worry about it. Yeah, you've got five extra months, let me know how you get on, yeah? Our world would be flipped upside down, wouldn't it, yeah? Our performance would go through the roof, yeah? Now we can source, attract, directly engage, give all of our attention to our candidates, yeah? Our credibility goes through the roof. Everything is linked to time, yeah? So imagine what we could be doing with 150 days extra. Briefing earlier, sourcing earlier, engaging candidates, writing better engagement messages. Our diversity and inclusion goes through the roof because we've got more time to be more inclusive with our recruitment campaigns, not just firing out ads hoping somebody sees it. So that's kind of a stark reality that we're working with customers that have got 150 days extra on all of their vacancies. STA functions, we kind of we're obsessed with cost per hire and thinking about cost. It's inevitable that we spend money recruiting, right? You, you know, generally speaking, you've got to spend money. Now, if you were to ask your hiring managers or your functional leaders whether they would soon you spend £500 recruiting a role and there'd be an, an empty chair in their team for four or five months, or spend 10 k and that seat be filled when they need it, I think you probably all know what the answer's going to be. And that's because there's a productivity cost associated with every single role in your business. And there's ways to figure it out. Some of them are more complicated than others, but just hold that thought for a second. Every single role in your business has a productivity value associated with it. Now, as TA professionals, it's our responsibility and our prerogative to start partnering and understanding what the value is to those roles. And thinking, actually, what's the value to the business in terms of how we hire that role out? Because the productivity cost is the important metric, not the cost per hire. And as soon as you start thinking like that, in, t in those terms, you'll have a very, very different conversation and relationship with your, your, uh, your hiring community. 
Now, if you take some figures, let's say, for example, the productivity cost is £500 a day, which is quite standard. You know, some of our customers have got sort of sales roles and others where it's actually thousands and thousands of pounds a day when there's an empty seat. For every 10 days it's empty, that's 5k. 30 days, 15k. I'm sure we all have those recruitment processes that are still open after 60, 70, 80, 90 days. And you can see why managers are starting to tear their hair out and become more and more um, upset because you know their team's stretched, their team's trying to cover it. So all of a sudden that empty chair cost as a metric is getting into the 20, 25, 30k for the business. So maybe spending 10k up front rather than a thousand on attraction would it would have been the right business decision. Again, I've touched on this previously in terms of quality. When we've got more time, yeah, what normally happens is a rec lands on at the last minute, we post and pray, we go out to agencies, and normally it results in hiring managers having to hire kind of the best like on the market, yeah, available at a time. But when we've got 150 days, we can write better engagement campaigns, yeah, which are going to bring in better quality candidates, so then we can hire the best in the market, not the best on the market, right? So it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer. The same goes with diversity inclusion. When we've got more time, yeah, we can strategically implement better programs to help us hit our DNI objectives. Because I'm sure Rebecca will touch on companies that have a really, really robust DNI uh, process, they're more profitable, right? So again, from a hiring manager perspective and exec level, it's a no-brainer. A plan is a vacant, a, a shopping list, right? Of every single vacancy your organisation is going to recruit over the next three, six, nine, twelve months, broken down by job title, grade, salary, location, even reason for leaving, but most importantly, where. Right? That is the only definition of a hiring plan. How do we get a plan? There is only one way. We do not know what hiring managers are going to recruit unless they tell us. Yeah? They've got all of these projects, levers, growth plans, uh, retirees, whirring away in their head, but they need to tell us. Yeah, we can't just nip into their bedrooms when they're asleep and extract this information. They need to tell us. That's the definition of being proactive. Anything other than that, we're living in reactive world. So my background is um, I joined Jacobs about two years ago. Um, before that, I was head of talent for a smaller company. And before that, agency recruiter, specialist um, IT, um, headhunting and search. So. What happened in terms of my foresight journey is um, I had a really interesting email from Seamus about GDLP, whatever it is, GDPR, or some of that old thing. Um, and I looked at and I saw that cartoon and it struck so many chords with me because I'd come from a small organisation and now I was in um, a, a much bigger corporate environment where I was the sole talent acquisition lead for company of about 3,000, responsible for 250 hires, um, and I was having a wonderful time having these really rich, proactive conversations with the hiring managers I knew about, but all, of, all the time I was getting bombarded by hiring managers I knew nothing about. So, and the thing for me as well, is that in my previous organisation, I'd learned very much from LinkedIn that the whole post and pray reactive recruitment model is, isn't where you want to be. We need to be able to move to this developmental, strategic, proactive way of recruiting. And the way to do that is to know what's coming down the line. The other thing is, and I noticed from a lot of your questions, you talked about you know, how do we attract the talent that we want? How do we engage with the candidates that we need? And what I've learned over my time in recruitment, and also from LinkedIn, is that the best candidates aren't looking. The best candidates are not going to be looking and responding to your marketing. The best candidates are waiting for us to reach out to them. Now that's going to take time. It takes about six months, sometimes a year, in order to warm up somebody who isn't actively looking. So how do we do that, and how do we add value in that time acquisition function if we haven't got a plan? We all know about the, the, the uh, data from McKinsey, which says that um, gender diverse companies are 15% more profitable, and ethnically diverse companies are 35% more profitable. It's been proven. All the CEOs believe it. There may be some reasons because of diversity of thought, diversity of thinking around the table, helps to win more business and be able to be more creative, but the bottom line is 
that we as talent acquisition professionals need to really be driving and delivering on that diversity agenda. And how do we do that? Because in my area, civil and structural engineering, there's very few, but there are women who we can get because we're number one global leader in our area. But we need the opportunity to. They're, they're happy where they are. We need the opportunity to know in advance when to go and get them. And that means that we need a plan. When um, Danny said about more time in the week in order to engage with your candidates, we all know that we haven't got the time to do that. We, think, we know that that proactive recruitment, picking up the telephone, reaching out on LinkedIn and following that is the right thing to do. But do we have the time to do it? No, we don't. There's two, I'm going to answer it in two ways. The first thing I, I, I know that Foresight's going to help me with is helping to educate my hiring community. So all of the hiring managers on there, as far as I'm concerned, have all got the responsibility for hiring as well as me. They've got their own referral networks. They've got retention strategies that they can put in place. They've got ways and they, they know um, from activating referrals and networking themselves that there's a responsibility on them to try and fulfill hiring needs. Where I come in is where I can, and is adding value on the talent acquisition side, which is being able to reach out to the candidates through LinkedIn predominantly. That's the only tool that we've got. Um, we don't invest in any other advertising medium apart from LinkedIn. The other thing is you might not get civil structural engineers on there. So it's, it's if I'm honest, it's, it's networking and it's really digging into the referral network because what happens with hiring managers is they'll think of somebody for their problem right now. They might think of somebody for the problem in March, but they're not keeping in touch with people over 12 month time. So my answer to you would be, you've got to develop your own network, using your hiring managers, using referrals, and start reaching out and keeping in contact, regular contact, and understanding what represents career development and opportunity to those people.